Samuel went to the Lord and said, Lord, he was just broken up and distraught and, and about, you know, tearing himself up. And, and, and God said, Samuel, do not worry about it because these people have not rejected you. They have rejected me because God was the one, was the one who appointed Samuel to be the judge over Israel. They had, you see, they live free. They had, that, they had land, they had fertile land, they had trade going on, they had everything, but they wanted to be like other people. So they wanted a king. And then uh, God said, okay, give them a king. So they got King Saul, but he said, God said, I'm going to give you a king, but here's what's going to happen. He's going to send your sons to war. So he's going to take them out of the land where they were happy farming and all that kind of thing. And he's going to send them off to war and he's going to enslave your, your women. He's going to put them in harems. He's going to tax you to death. And, and, and we see what has happened over the years. So freedom, sure, you get, they, they made a free choice to get a king, but it came with a price. Because if you, if you, if you think you're exercising freedom outside the will of God and, you ex, and you're really exercising your own personal freedom, it's going to come with a price. And that's how it is, uh, how people get into captivity. Uh, all through the, the, the millennium, all through these past five, six thousand years of creation, man has tried to hold other men captive for power, one reason or another. Uh, the Western civilizations like the United States, uh, Eastern, uh, Western Europe and so on, uh, experimented with democracy and uh, so far it's going well here in this country. But, but you always have people and politicians who try to get people into a sort of a bondage or even a welfare state mentality where you get them hooked on free, on so-called free things and, and then they come to the price and uh, next thing you know, the family is disintegrating and all kinds of bad things. So man has always tried to hold other men in captivity. So, so that's the human condition. Whether we're in tyranny or democracy, freedom is what we're yearning for. The United States has shed a lot of blood, um, of, of our own blood, our own soldiers, freeing people around the world. I mean, uh, Spanish America, from the Spanish-American War till right now, all through the 20th century, World War One, World War Two, the, the Cold War, um, Vietnam, which didn't go too well, and Iraq, 50, 000, 50 million people were freed in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, women were free, are not free to go to school and stuff like that. So there's that kind of freedom. There's, there's uh, the external freedom that uh, we, we enjoy here in this great country, in, in the United States, this great country. And then there's the, uh, the inner freedom. And, but a lot of us are held uh, captive, kept, held, held captive by lifestyle. Modern lifestyle is, is, is just out of control. Um, you got work. Uh, it's not so bad here in the Springfield area where, we, where the traffic is not as bad as, say, Chicago or, or even these terrible places like Los Angeles or, and other places where you have to commute for two hours on a highway. But if you've ever been outside um, I-55, outside Chicago, at 7.30 in the morning, and you get stuck in traffic, you, it's going to be an hour and a half before you get downtown city. So you have to leave home at 5 in the morning, 5, 6 in the morning to get downtown at 7.30, 8. So there you have that. And you have work, and you have um, taxes. Taxes are because of the state of um, the economy and, and budgets and, and governments. Taxes are going up. Stress. Um, you have you have captivity of stress. You have the cost of living going sky high. Those are just the financial things. Uh, um, what about uh, Helen? Be held captive to schedules. Um, apart from our work, daily work schedules, from say the time you get on the road to commute until you get home in the evening, say let's say between seven and five thirty or six, then you have supper. Then you have uh, you got to take the kids to. Uh, Soccer, baseball, football, practice, uh, symphony practice, uh, anything. Um, you're running there, you're running here, you're running there. You, you help captive to schedule. And, um, 
and sometimes you just you just feel like pulling your hair out. And and also there's the captivity of addiction. You have this captivity of the schedule, you have the captivity of the addiction. Your people are hooked on pornography. That is very that's horrible. Pornography has destroyed many marriages and destroyed the minds of many a human being, man, woman, and child, and, and more and more our, our young people, um, especially those with, with uh, internet on their phones, are downloading this garbage onto their cell phones and, um, and sharing it around. And, and there's something called sexting now where they're sending bad pictures of, of themselves across the cell phone, which is a, it's a federal law, which is a violation of federal law. Pornography. Uh, it used to be that in the old days you had to put on a raincoat and, or, or go in some store that was boarded around with no windows and buy something in a brown paper bag. Not anymore. You just go sit down behind the computer and, and I guess you probably look behind you to see who's watching you and, and then you start clicking away. And, and these uh, pornography, I don't know, I think John, Dr. John MacArthur, he's one of the great preachers of America, he did a survey once. He said that there's like a, 70% of most of the websites, I think, it's either between 60 and 70% of all the websites in the world are pornographic. Now, this is outrageous. The internet has become a, the playground of Satan, and he's trying to get into your mind and destroy your children and destroy your marriage and your family. Don't let him. There's the addiction of that. There's a the captivity of of, pe of people uh, of, on alcohol and drugs. That holds you in a captivity. Alcoholics. Um, some people think they can drink uh, socially every day. I know, I know people who uh, have to go home and have a beer. Now, that's a, that's a social alcoholic right there. They, think they, can, they say they don't drink during the day, but you're drinking daily. And then there's your captivity of, uh, of even being held captive by sports and, uh, and Nintendos and Wii's and uh, you know, Xbox and that kind of thing. And there's even the captivity of being uh, busy, doing busy things in ministry. Um, I, I know a lot of people do a lot of stuff in, in the church. And um, you can get so, so caught up and, and held help captive by thinking that you're working so hard for God that, that you forget what's so important, which is the relationship with Him. You know, remember the story in the Bible where, uh, where Jesus was, um, was sitting there and Mary and Martha were, were arguing about who should be uh, helping whom in the kitchen while one of them sat at his feet. You know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, chapter 4, verse 8. Let's, let's read what Jesus said. Luke 4, verse 18. We're talking about captivity and freedom. Luke 14. Yes, ma'am. Jesus said, and this is actually a, a fulfillment of the prophecy from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set me to proclaim release, release of freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Let me read this part, uh, relevant part here again. He has sent me, God has sent His Son, with the anointing of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost upon Him, to proclaim release to the captives, he wasn't talking about people who were in jail because at the time, the, the, the Hebrews, the Jews, were looking for a political Messiah to free them from Rome. That wasn't why Jesus came. He came to set the captives, the Jew first and then Gentiles, to proclaim release, freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and not just the blind who couldn't see physically, but us, who couldn't see beyond our noses sometimes until, until he... He saved us and opened up the world to us. And where we can see like Him, well, we can have His eyes and see as He would see. And by the way, the only way to see like Christ would see 
is to get into his word, study his word, study Christ.